We lost Fernando. No, you didn't lo lose. Ah, me. here you are. Hello. So uh, now we continue as expected. Uh, we are late already. Okay, anyway, uh, with uh, Tal Dagan, who will talk about the, Dar the Darwinian fitness of extrachromosomal genetic elements. You have 20 minutes, Tal. Yeah, thank you very much. Good. See the presentation fine? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so, right, so thank you again, Fernando de la Cruz, also for the uh, introduction for plasmids, also saying that plasmids are quite complex. So what I would like to maybe try to convince you that they are also not only complex, but could be uh, considered as real Darwinian entities. Right, so um, the view on, on the determinants of uh, plasmid persistence in the population is that uh, we have uh, a, an interplay between the effect of uh, plasmid effect on the host fitness, and this might uh, depend on the environmental conditions. Right, so if we take here the example of antibiotic resistance plasmids, if we start, uh, if a plasmid is found in we start usually in the lab, for example, with 100% uh, hosts of the plasmid. In the absence of selection, we would expect the, the plasmid to decrease in frequency due to the negative fitness effect on the host. But with the uh, uh, selection, for example, for the plasmid presence in here antibiotics, we would see the plasmid uh, uh, frequency in the population going up. But uh, according to that kind of a, uh, of, uh, view if, if the plasmid always have a, has a very negative effect on the host fitness, then you would expect the plasmid uh, to uh, decrease in frequency and at the end to go extinct from the population. Um, yet, uh, also as noted here in the, in the previous talk, I think by Connie Smala, um, this might not always uh, be the case. Very often you might have uh, conditions in the environment where the plasmids have a less, um, a smaller effect on the host fitness, uh, which we even might turn them as neutral plasmids or even neutral conditions for the plasmid presence in the host. Right, so what happens uh, under non-selective conditions? In order to try and answer that uh, question, um, a couple of years ago, we uh, performed an experiment of uh, plasmid evolution under non-selective conditions. And uh, here we, we evolved a model uh, plasmid that we call here the, the ancestral plasmid. This is a PBBR1 uh, uh, derivative. So it's a relatively low copy number of about five if you take it into the naive host, which is in our case, uh, uh, Escherichia coli. And we, we made it very, very small so that the fitness effect on the host was yeah, almost negligible. So you might say it's a semi-neutral plasmid. We evolved it in under uh, non-selective conditions for the plasmid presence. Uh, nonetheless, the plasmid uh, was unstable. So the frequency of the plasmid in the population was decreasing. But then when the PG student back then, Tana Wein, uh, exposed the population to uh, antibiotics, so selecting for the presence of the plasmid and then went on with the experiment under non-selective conditions, we could see several plasmid variants that evolved stability. So they were uh, present in the population continuously in 100% of the hosts and not, uh, yeah, uh, were not lost anymore. When we sequenced the plasmid, we observed uh, a small duplication in the plasmid genome segmental dupli duplication that apparently made this uh, plasmid stable. Right? So we show here evidence for evolution of plasmid stability or stable plasmid inheritance under non-selective conditions. Now, if you think of what happened during this experiment, during sometime during our experiment in, in the populations, there was, uh, yeah, occurred the, the, the segmental duplication that we observed in the plasmids. So the way we would picture it is that we would have um, 
heterogenic host that include both uh, plasmid types, the ancestral one, and the, and the evolved one with their segmental uh, duplications. Right, so our next question was then, uh, is this genetic variation in the plasmid genome indeed associated with variation in fitness of the plasmid? We have from this experiment ordered the preliminary answer, but we could um, ask this in a much more direct fashion. So what is important under non-selective conditions? Uh, the most important is that the plasmid will be able to complete the plasmid uh, life cycle in a way that uh, it can replicate, uh, resolve the, the plasmid uh, copies and then uh, yeah, divide or segregate into the, into the daughter cells. Right? So um, failure to uh, undergo any of these steps would lead to the plasmid uh, loss and over time also to the plasmid extinction. Right, so uh, we hypothesize that plasmid persistence under non-selective conditions would depend on the plasmid Darwinian fitness. Uh, in other words, uh, you could call it reproductive success. So the success of the plasmid to complete the plasmid life cycle. And our approach is uh, competition experiments. And here I show uh, for the benefit of those who don't do it every day, what does it mean for cells, right? If we compete cells, we mix them in, uh, uh, so we, we have two genotypes here, the blue and the red. We mix them in a ratio of 50-50 uh, or one-to-one. -one. And then we transfer them over time and, and ask in each generation, how many do we have of the uh, red or the blue cells? Right. And if you see that the red uh, cells are increasing over time, you would say that they have a higher reproductive success or therefore higher fitness. Right. So um, together with uh, Niels Hulter, we adopted this idea in order to quantify the fitness of uh, plasmids using that concept, but this time in uh, uh, pairwise in cellular competitions between plasmids. So the idea is we can bring the plasmids into the same cell, right? So we call it the head-to-head -head competitions. We then uh, evolve them uh, under non-selective conditions. And then we ask uh, for the evolving evolved population, what's the frequency of the competing plasmids? So you can do it like a head-to-head -head competition as we plotted here. And in addition, you can also ask what happens if we have a preemptive competition when the plasmid is invading a cell that is already um, uh, populated by a competing plasmid. We call it here the endemic plasmid. Our expectation is that if uh, plasmid stability is a determinant of the plasmid fitness, then the stable plasmid, in our case, the one with the segmental duplication, is expected to outcompete the unstable plasmid. So the uh, model plasmids we used for our competitions were exactly the plasmids I already told you about, but without too much details. We have here the unstable plasmid, which was our back then ancestral plasmid. And we have the uh, stable plasmid, which is the evolved one with the small segmental duplication. This is this extra piece that we have in that plasmid, but not here. And uh, having two different antibiotic resistance genes on or marker genes on the two plasmids enables us to quantify them in the population after the experiment. We also replace the, the marker so that we can also check, uh, check the effect of the marker, but I will not show that one here. At any rate, we competed uh, our plasmids. Uh, so we were able to bring them together into, into the hosting cells and then let them evolve over a very short time and ask at the end, which of the plasmids is more um, frequent in the population. So we have here the in blue, the unstable plasmid, and then the stable plasmid. Um, and what we see in this graph, this is the head-to-head -head, uh, competition. We have here uh, 36 uh, replicates of the competitions. And uh, each of these uh, bars are stacked bar plots that show us the frequency of the plasmids in the population. And in the replicate population. What we see here is mostly that the stable plasmid was uh, winning in most of the cases uh, in the head-to-head -head competitions. And when we repeated the competitions with the unstable plasmid uh, here as the endemic one, or of course also with the stable plasmid as the endemic one, 
uh, again, the stable plasmid always won. We have here some cases of coexistence of the plasmid, uh, yeah, and uh, also some cases here of the unstable plasmid winning. Of course, there are some more details in this work. You can uh, see it in the in that publication. At any rate, the, the conclusion here is that the stable plasmid uh, wins in such a competition. Therefore, if we take the lesson from competition experiments between cells, we can say that the stable plasmids have a higher fitness in comparison to the unstable ones. Now that's kind of a proof of uh, concept to say that uh, we can quantify plasmid fitness and plasmids can evolve uh, stability in the lab and also um, uh, win over unstable plasmids. And that enables us to go into the next question, uh, which is um, about the origins of essential plasmids or plasmids that encode essential genes, right? We were interested to know whether such plasmids might uh, first evolve uh, a stable inheritance or stability first, or uh, first are essential to the host and then evolve a stable inheritance. So what is an essential gene? Just for the formal um, definition, this is a gene that is required for the uh, reproduction of an organism. Typically, we would find such uh, genes uh, on bacterial chromosomes, but not always. We do have examples of plasmids encoding essential genes. And one example here is vitamin B biosynthesis pathway in uh, Rhesia, that's an endosymbiont of uh, humanoid uh, lice, um, or leucine and tryptophan biosynthesis pathways in, uh, in uh, Buchnera, uh, an endosymbiont of aphids, or the by a very extreme example, the ribosomal RNA operon in uh, Aurimonas, uh, which was isolated from soybeans. So such examples indeed uh, occur in nature. And again, we, we are interested then to, to test different scenarios for the evolution of such essential plasmids. In the essentiality first, the acquired essential plasmid evolves a stable inheritance and the stability first and uh, initially stable plasmid becomes essential. And that's by gene gain. And um, yeah, mathematical models uh, support this scenario. This is a Tatsiman and Al paper from uh, in MBE uh, several years ago. Right, so um, yes, yeah, Fernando said bioinformatics would be easier than going to the lab. So we, we did both, but we started with uh, bioinformatics and uh, Wang here uh, first asked how often do we see essential genes in plasmids? Um, he analyzed the data set of about 600 Escherichia genomes and um, tested the presence of about 500 genes identified by um, others in lab experiments, knockout experiments, uh, as essential genes, <clears throat> sorry, in Escherichia. What we see um, out of the results in here, we see here the, the genes. And here, the, um, yeah, each dot is basically a plasmid. And uh, our uh, results show that out of those essential genes, only uh, 17 of those could be found in plasmids. Um, we have here a large number of plasmids, but this is a bit biased uh, because the SSB, the single standard binding protein that uh, was mentioned in the context of conjugation is also essential when it is on the chromosome. Um, but otherwise, you see here that this is actually a very rare uh, case that uh, an essential gene would be on a plasmid. Um, many of those plasmids encoding essential genes are conjugative. And um, uh, these, uh, these genes that we see in here as essential and appearing on plasmids are very often duplicated in the isolates, so present in two copies in the chromosome and the plasmid, except for one rare case of MEDG in a single isolate. Right, so we were uh, very curious then to, to try and go forward in, and ask the same question in the lab, essentiality first versus the stability first. And we picked our, as our test case here, the GOIL, GOIS, the chaperonin. Um, these two uh, genes uh, are translated, co-translated very, uh, very often, and they are uh, part of the chaperonin complex, which is, uh, yeah, it's a chaperone of protein folding, which is known um, yeah, as obligatory in, in Escherichia. 
So um, right, the, the evolution of that, uh, the, the goel, goyes on plasmids um, is actually in uh, quite an interesting case of these essential genes being on plasmids. Um, uh, Wang recently uh, performed uh, this, this analysis asking uh, what uh, is the origin of these, ch these chaperonins on the plasmids. And he actually found out that they are part of um, uh, transposon TN125, where they are uh, present in two different uh, types of this uh, uh, transposable element, uh, also accompanied by antibiotic resistant genes. We see here the two types. So this is one, this is two. This is a phylogenetic tree of the Goyel part of, uh, of this um, uh, transposable element. We see here the chromosomal part, uh, you see here in black, uh, sorry, in, in blue, this is uh, all of the chromosomal encoded Goyel. Uh, and this is here the plasmid encoded uh, Goyel. So this is the blue and the pink. And on the outer ring, we see the organisms in this analysis. So the chromosomal encoded Goyel occurs here in the data set that we worked with Klebsiella, Salmonella, and Escherichia. Um, and here in the plasmid, we can see that this type of the transposable element is mostly present in Escherichia and Salmonella, so this uh, blue and yellow. And this type of the transposable element is mostly present in Escherichia and Klebsiella. We actually identified here only a one putative case of uh, transfer of this Goyel uh, between plasmid and chromosome. So this one is uh, grouping with the chromosomes and occurs on a plasmid. In that context, you might want to uh, look at this publication uh, showed up in uh, Nature Communication three weeks ago by Akman et al uh, with much more data on this uh, transposable element. Right, so we said uh, that we will go to the lab, and indeed, uh, Tanita Wein, uh, back then a PhD student in the group, um, tested this, uh, wanted to test this essentiality first versus um, stability first. Um, in the lab, what she did, she uh, used the, the two model plasmids that we had, the unstable and stable plasmids. Um, right, so the, the stable one always have this uh, small segmental duplication here that makes it stable. And this time she uh, cloned into those plasmids the chaperonin uh, grow E uh, exactly as we found it in the transposable element. Now, um, these uh, two plasmids, the stable and unstable plasmids encoding the chaperonin, were introduced in two types of hosts. One is our uh, yeah, model organism, Escherichia coli MG1655, the, the, yeah, the, one we, the usual one we work in the lab. And when you introduce this, uh, these two plasmids into that uh, host, the Groyel is found in two copies, the chromosome and the plasmid. So it is not essential in this uh, host background. The other one is MG1, MGM100 um, being, uh, so that was uh, cloned in a time that Goyel was a highlight uh, subject for, for research in, uh, in Sherisha Coli. And what um, this constellation or this background does, we can silence the expression of the Goyel in the chromosome. And in that background, when we silence the chromosomal copy, the plasmid copy is essential. Right, so the essential, essential yes, no, is determined by the host uh, background. And the plasmid stability is determined by the plasmid type. Right, so we um, started from uh, with both plasmids and both uh, host backgrounds and uh, serial um, transfers or experimental evolution. And um, what we see in here, this is the non-essential host. And we have here the line showing the uh, proportion of hosts in the population over time for the stable and unstable plasmids. So the unstable is green, the stable is uh, pink. And we can see that when the plasmid is not essential for the host, right? because the Goyel is also encoded in the chromosome, the plasmid is lost regardless of the plasmid stability. Right? So both the stable and unstable plasmids are being lost. When we uh, perform this experiment in the background of the MGM100 where the plasmid is essential for the host, we see Right, that the plasmid uh, uh, proportion in the population is always 100%. Uh, in other words, whoever is losing the plasmid is immediately dead. 
right? So the plasmid is stable in the population uh, or it has a stable persistence in the population regardless of, regardless of the inherent instability of the plasmid. Okay, the next was to ask, right? What's the effect of the plasmid on the host fitness? And here we have uh, the ancestral results for the ancestral uh, uh, hosts. So the um, stable plasmid is pink and the unstable is, is green. And we can see that when we look at the host MG1655, where the plasmid is not essential, the plasmid uh, yeah, introduction reduces the host fitness. And also in the uh, essential background MG100, the plasmid introduction reduces the, the host fitness. This is when the, yeah. Then when we look here at the evolved uh, host, what we see in here is that the MG1655, when the plasmid is not essential, even after the evolution experiment here, the uh, plasmid is still has uh, um, an effect, a negative effect on the host fitness. But if we look here at the essential background MG100, we see that uh, the host and plasmid are now well adapted. And uh, nonetheless, it, is, it doesn't really matter if the plasmid was initially stable or unstable. Um, we see here that the plasmid now could persist in the population or be fixed in the population. Right, so, um, right, taken together, our results show that the redundant chromosomal gene uh, in a plasmid is disadvantageous to the host cell. And uh, we think that this is very often due to uh, those effects, even from, for uh, the chaperonin, and that uh, plasmid essentiality can lead to a long-term persistence of the plasmid, regardless of the initial stability of that plasmid in the population. Right, so to summarize, um, evolution of uh, plasmid stability can lead to the persistence of neutral plasmids in the population or plasmids in the population under neutral conditions. Um, we find that there's a direct link between plasmid fitness and the plasmid genetics, just like we, we know for living organisms. Um, yes, yet um, unstable plasmids can be maintained in the population if they are essential for the host. And um, our results uh, suggest that the natural selection can operate at two different levels on the host population to maintain the plasmid or uh, on the plasmid to evolve stability. Right, so um, right. Yeah, overall we can uh, now say that principles that apply for the evolution of cellular entities uh, may be applied to understand the evolution of uh, plasmids as well. Right, with that, I'm uh, done for today. I acknowledge here the uh, yeah, funding agencies and the pictures of the group that I didn't show on the way uh, with the leading authors. And uh, right, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Okay. Thank you. Questions? For Tal. I've got a question. Oh, Stephanie, you can go first. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I had a question about the first part of your talk. So, when you showed the competition between plasmids within cells, um, so you showed that in the majority of the cases, it's the stable plasmid that won the competition. But you still had some cases uh, where the, it was the other one or you had coexistence and, and it was actually replicates. So really identical conditions initially as much as you could control them. So you have, a, I mean, if, if we do competitions between two genotype of cells, usually the, the winner of the competition is always the same. So is there, do you think it's due to stochastic process in the partition of the plasmid or how do you explain this variability? Yes, yes. 
Yeah, so we we think that the, there are a lot of uh, stochastic uh, processes going on here. Okay. So so what what we, we do have in the publication also statistical testing of that. So the when the plasmid wins, it wins significantly. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, like in uh, uh, in here, for example, right? Uh, we do have uh, some cases where the unstable plasmid won. And, and this can be, for example, if uh, we, we are not sure exactly why, right? We would like to go and look into that in detail, but if, for example, to begin with, that plasmid was uh, somehow managed to have the higher copy number at the beginning, this might, might have an effect, right? But this, this I, I cannot say. I would say it's more stochastic. Uh, the cases that we mark here as coexistence, we uh, went forward and, and checked what the, those are, and those were actually um, uh, plasmid fusions. So it turned out that uh, because the plasmids were actually very similar in their back backbone, they could fuse mm -hmm. and uh, produce not only dimers, but also trimers and, and, and more. And uh, nonetheless, those, those multimers could uh, yeah, segregate monomers, right? So uh, one of the conclusions that we had in that uh, publication was that such plasmid fusions can maintain an unstable plasmid variant in the population over quite long time scales, especially if you would have um, conditions that uh, select for the presence of, of the two plasmids. Thank you. Yeah. There were a couple of uh, questions in the chat. So shall I just, I will just answer. So the initial set, the, the proportion of the plasmid, the T0, when we start the experiment is always 100% because we said the plasmids that we use here as a central, they have, uh, they encode for an antibiotic resistance uh, gene and we can select for all of the hosts that, that have them at the beginning before we remove the selection. Thank you. Yes, and then the question about the, where the unstable plasmid wins, the, the fitness uh, that we, we have our conclusion on the higher fitness or so reproduction of the stable plasmid is a statistical one. So right, we have here uh, 36 replicates and we have, uh, yeah, we are using here a binomial test to ask which plasmid wins uh, significantly more than the expected by chance, if you would say, for example, for a one-to-one -one outcome. Yes, Jamie, you have a question. Thanks, Al. Um, so you've shown really nicely that in a direct competition between essentiality and stability, essentiality wins. But this is just looking at the selection part of evolution, right? And am I not right in thinking that an essential plasmid is more likely to evolve under a stable background because just of a larger population size? Uh, I'm not sure about the population size. Uh, from this experiment, our take is that an essential plasmid is uh, less likely to evolve in a stable background, so stable background of the plasmid, because it is very often uh, would lead to a dose effect. Right, and, and so actually the, the, the presence or the duplication of an essential gene on a stable plasmid would create, let's call it a conflict between the chromosome and the plasmid in the cell. Right, so what, what we think is actually that you might be able to find such essential plasmids um, uh, via gene transfer and, and possibly replacement or they, they should diverge a bit. Actually for, for, this, um, for, for this case, yeah, we, we just one just found this uh, publication today, but it's also very fresh from three weeks ago. They uh, predict or infer that the origin of this transposable element is from Acinetobacter. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, we already found a couple of uh, months ago, there was a paper from last year in MBio showing compatibility between the Goyal, the chaperoning between Escherichia and Acinetobacter. So it kind of fits, uh, but that means that this is really a, an event, this, this chaperoning on a plasmid uh, in Escherichia is a really uh, a gene transfer event and not a duplication of the, of the chromosomal gene. So yeah, you would think like in the MEDG that we have in here, the one very uh, unusual example, it, it has to be to, to go in several steps. If, if, to find, if you find an essential, or let's call it a homolog of an essential gene on a plasmid, either it was not essential before, yeah, when the plasmid came in, 
right? And essentiality evolved after, or it's uh, several steps of replacing of the chromosomal gene. Thanks. Yes, Sonia. Yeah, thanks a lot for this really interesting talk. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little more about the concept of essentiality here. Uh, so, because I guess in some ways you could say that any gene that is selected for is in a sense essential because you'd expect the, the, the strains with that gene to outcompete the other ones. So do you, the, do you expect the results that you present to hold for any gene under selection or for genes that are under very strong selection? Yes. Um, so first of all, on, on the data that we have here, right, it's all coming from experiments, usually of uh, knockouts. Uh, the most uh, new addition to this is a very cool publication from uh, uh, Francois Rousseau et al. in, in Nature Communications, uh, Nature Microbiology, two years ago. Uh, they uh, compare the essentiality of genes in different Escherichia strains in, in uh, three different media conditions. And indeed, they show that essentiality, real essentiality, depends also on the conditions, which is, of course, expected, right? And many of those were, were tested in maybe two media types, like the, the very rich media and relatively poor media. So, yes, I, th I think. Right. If if uh, if if we talk about selection coefficient or pressure, then this is probably the highest one we can have. Right. Maybe maybe you will go it, into that into your talk. Um, yes. So I guess that if if you would live all of your lives in antibiotic, then antibiotic and this gene will become essential. Yeah. Maybe you can explain more on that. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Liam. Thanks, Tal. That's really interesting. I just wanted to say on that, because um, I'm on that uh, ACMAN 2022 paper. Oh. Um, so that, yeah, yeah, very much the focus there is on the, the antibiotic resistance gene, um, which is this NDM beta lactamase. Um, so it's really interesting that there, yeah, I don't think we even clocked that, you know, we wrote grow S, grow L, hadn't clocked that it was a uh, chaperone in like and uh, as you explain that it's this essential thing so that's a really interesting cool. pairing of how success of a plasmid um can be linked to those things mm -hmm. yeah. thank you yeah very nice paper <laughs> yeah great okay if there are no more questions uh, we can go to the next speaker we Sonia Letinen, who uh, will talk about why do some bacterial genes reside on the chromosome and others on plasmid. 